Yeah. Uh, good afternoon or evening is the case may, may be. I'm never sure what we do with five o'clock. Um, on behalf of the Goldstein Program in Public Affairs, I'd like to welcome you to our event. Um, Christine Wade, the Associate Professor of Political Science and International Studies and Curator of the Goldstein Program in Public Affairs. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to say a word about Louis Goldstein. Um, Louis L. Goldstein um, was an alum of Washington College. He graduated in the class of 1935 and was a long-term public servant to the state of Maryland, and he worked in state government for more than 60 years. He was also a member of the college's Board of Visitors and Governors and served as chairman of the board for 18 years. In recognition of his example of public service, in 1990, Washington College created an endowment to support the Louis L. Goldstein Program in Public Affairs. And through a series of lectures, symposia, visiting fellows, and other projects, the program seeks to foster awareness of how government works and how policy is established. Over the years, the Goldstein Program has hosted journalists, political activists, foreign policy analysts, diplomats, military commanders, uh, government officials, and of course academics, right, of both national and international stature. Today we have an encore performance, of course, because Dr. Wiarda has given a Goldstein lecture here before, yes. Um, it's a tremendous honor for me to introduce Dr. Howard Wiarda to you today. He's the Dean Russ Professor of International Relations and the founding head of the Department of International Affairs at the University of Georgia. He's also a senior scholar at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and a public policy scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center in DC. I've been wrestling with his CV for several days, trying to figure out how I'm going to parse down this lifetime of amazing accomplishments into something that might do him justice. Um, I decided it's actually not possible um, if we want to hear him speak today. Uh, <laughs> um, but let me give you a snippet um, of, of what Dr. Riarda has done in his um, rather prestigious career. And he's known by many as a scholar of Latin American politics and US policy in the region, but he's also known for his work on comparative democratization, civil society, and American foreign policy. And he's covered cases including Russia, Central and Eastern Europe, Asia, Western Europe, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Try not to get daunted by this, but he's published or edited over 70 books and over 300 articles book chapters, op-eds, et cetera. You got a lot of spare time, right? Yeah, yeah. He also has a newsletter that he puts out every quarter, yeah? Very, very busy. He has been ranked among the um, top five most influential scholars um, of Latin America and among the top 20 in the entire field of comparative politics. I think we all know I'm number 21, <laughs> right? He has held numerous prestigious visiting appointments, including a number of stints at the Center of International Affairs at Harvard University, MIT, Georgetown, George Washington, and the Foreign Service Institute. He was a resident scholar and founding director of the Center for Hemispheric Studies at the American Enterprise Institute, lead consultant to the Kissinger Commission on Central America, professor of the National Security Affairs at the National Defense University, where he also directed the program on redefining U.S. security interests in the post-Cold War era, and in 1988 served on Vice President George Herbert Walker Bush's foreign policy advisory team. He's the recipient of numerous grants, far too many for me to elaborate here, but I will say four Fulbright Awards, not bad, right? Um, and grants from very prestigious institutions including Rockefeller, um, the Social Science Research Council, Tinker, Mellon, National Endowment for the Humanities, National Institutes of Health, Pew, it goes on and on and on um, for pages. Uh, one of the anecdotes when I queried some of our um, common colleagues, do you have any clever stories to tell about Howard? Um, and I got a couple. But one of them was about a fax machine that almost exploded in Scott Palmer's office when Dr. Wiarda tried to fax his CV over, right, because it nearly burnt it out. And just in case you're thinking that he's some policy wonk or research university scholar locked in an ivory tower, I just want to mention that he's also received numerous awards for distinguished teaching. 
so in this query that I sent out to my fellow academics, and you should, people say such nice things about you, it's so nice, but I found one snippet that I wanted to share because I think it is the ultimate compliment to an academic, and it comes from someone who was his ideological adversary in the 1980s. And they said, Howard is an academic in the best sense. He has a clear understanding of what he believes while at the same time allowing others to hold their beliefs without demonizing them or their analyses. And that might just be about the nicest thing you can say about an academic. So I give to you Dr. Howard Wearda. Thanks for, very much, Christine, uh, for that very generous introduction. I was hoping you would, wait, you would read all 34 pages of that CV and thus cut my lecture a little bit shorter. Um, that's really nice of you to do. This is a special place, this college for me. I've been here before uh, to give lectures. It's a beautiful college campus. I know the students well. I know quite a few of the faculty. Um, I'm honored that the president is here. Thank you very much for attending. And I promised him that I would tell him a story uh, right at the beginning. And uh, Mr. President, feel free after I tell this story to leave if you, if you wish, because this is actually the best part of the whole lecture. Um, I think there's only one or two other people in the room that I can recognize who know that uh, 20 years ago, I was asked to be a candidate uh, for the presidency at Washington College. Um, I turned it down at the time, but when you, when you get on the list of, a potential, of being a potential candidate at, uh, at one college, um, you turn up, whether you wish to or not, on various other headhunter lists. And so I got invited to be a candidate at some other colleges as well. Um, among the things that I learned is that uh, roughly 80% of the job is fundraising. I don't know what your, what's your estimate, Mr. President, of the fundraising percentage of the job. It's, it's huge. And uh, you all should have empathy for your president who has to be out there every single night eating that rubber chicken and other awful things that they serve you out on the circuit. Um, I, I was also surprised when I was a candidate uh, for a college presidency to discover that the same people are candidates for every college presidency. And uh, even though these candidacies uh, are wrapped in mystery and, uh, and, uh, and silence, uh, so that you won't be identified, I, I discovered that uh, two other people from my own universities were also candidates for the same position that I was a candidate for, uh, just after they had declared undying loyalty to the institution uh, that they were about to leave. Uh, uh, and they were surprised to find me out there as a candidate, since uh, my background is not so much uh, university administration, it's really uh, think tank work, but I knew a lot about fundraising from my Washington think tank days. And I was surprised to find them out there because I knew that they had promised their own universities that they would not be candidates somewhere else, and lo and behold, you know, they're we're all hypocrites, I suppose, at a certain level. I also learned, uh, Mr. President, that for a college this size, uh, beside the president, you only need four people. Um, you need a dean of students whose primary responsibility is to keep the students from damaging the place. You need either a provost or a dean of faculty to keep the faculty from destroying uh, the place. You need a director of development to keep the money flowing in. And you need a techie to keep the computers running. 
That's all you need. Now, if some of you worry about the fact that maybe at Washington College, the administration has expanded beyond these four functions, and you have all of these administrators making high salaries, uh, even though they go beyond the four functions that I just described, uh, maybe that's grounds for a heated editorial in the campus newspaper. Uh, but in any case, uh, that's my history of being a candidate for the presidency of Washington College. I wonder how my life would have been different had I become serious about that uh, position back 20 years ago. Certainly, I wouldn't have written all of those books that, that uh, Christine has, has outlined. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. You're, 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 you're wonderfully lucky to have uh, Christine Wade as one of your professors, because she is lively and dynamic and also knows her stuff, uh, which doesn't always occur in this field. Well, my topic tonight is hemispheric security in uh, the Latin American region. I think many of you know that a lot of us here, including uh, your own Professor Wade, uh, believe that Washington does not pay sufficient attention to Latin America. We don't take it seriously. Uh, we tend to uh, not empathize with the region. Um, North America has always been condescending and patronizing toward our neighbors to the south. Uh, we are still that way, by and large, as a country. Uh, we tend to believe that the Latin Americans can't govern themselves. We have images in the back of our mind, you know, from New Yorker cartoons of comical, they're always comical, they're always mustachioed, uh, Latin American colonels galloping in and out of the presidential palace. Um, we compare ourselves uh, favorably with Latin America because that is still a third world area and we are a wealthy and an affluent area. It's probably an exaggeration, but nevertheless, Washington does habitually uh, avoid uh, paying serious attention to the Latin American part of the world, except when domestic politics, let's say, uh, immigration forces Latin America onto our attention uh, and most prominently onto our television screens. Now fortunately for us, uh, the hemisphere remains by and large a region of peace. There has not been a serious war anywhere in Latin America, and think of this in comparison with Europe, uh, for example, anywhere in Latin America for at least 80 years, uh, although there have been various border skirmishes and uh, smaller scale conflicts, but nothing comparable to World Wars I or II or even the Cold War. I want to argue also that the security challenges in the Americas today are uh, quite different from what they were in the past. Quite a number of you in the room grew up during the Cold War era. Uh, you know that the Cold War and the Soviet threat for all of those years since the mid-1940s, right up until 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed, skewed and warped our policy toward Latin America, forced us to worry about uh, guerrilla groups uh, in the region that also uh, skewed uh, American thinking about Latin America. Uh, we feared for a long time that all of Latin America might uh, go communist or imitate the Cuban Revolution. Um, and that is all changing. Now, at the core of present day uh, difficulties in the region are a number of factors that I want to draw your attention to. Um, it's a different world out there, both in Latin America and in U.S. Latin American relations than was the case in the past. There's a whole series of things that you know as well as I that are occurring, including globalization, um, interdependence among nations. We are probably more interdependent with Latin America at this stage than any other region in the world. Um, we are more affected 
affected by what occurs in Latin America or Mexico than any other area of the world through immigration and the flow of people and labor supplies and drugs and tourism um, and oil and natural gas. Uh, it's not well known that Mexico um, is the second largest trading partner of the United States, ahead of China or Japan, and behind only uh, Canada in this respect. Um, we are shaped by uh, awful headlines and television coverage which shows bloody bodies in the streets of Mexico, which also presents a distorted picture of the region. Uh, so we're prisoners of uh, some of our media coverage, we're prisoners of, uh, of our own prejudices and history, we're, pre we're, we're, we're victims uh, of the fact that we tend to be uh, condescending and patronizing toward Latin America, uh, and we look down on the region. Now I want to emphasize a number of new trends that force us to rethink uh, security issues and security challenges uh, within the region. The first one that I want to speak about uh, uh, is the incomplete development of democratic institutions within the region, uh, which, uh, as Professor Wade knows, has had an impact on the, on the, on the uh, academic and the literature on Latin America as well. That is, uh, 10 or 15 years ago, there was enormous emphasis on what was called uh, the transitions to democracy in Latin America. Um, some of us uh, were a little skeptical of that literature and that movement even at the time. But in fact, what has occurred is that Latin America, while it has democratized over the last uh, 20 years, the State Department is very fond of citing the statistic that, 20, that 19 out of the 20 Latin American countries are now democratic, the sole exception being Cuba. But uh, when we say that 19 out of the 20 countries are democratic, that hides a lot of things. It obscures uh, a lot of things. And most of the Latin American countries, even today, are only partially democratic. They have enormous inequalities among the social classes. There is enormous inequality among the races uh, in Latin America. Democratic institutions still remain uh, very weak. The statistics that we have show that only 50% of the population uh, are supportive of democratic rule, 50%. Um, and one wonders what the other 50% are thinking, either of military authoritarianism, presumably, or of a Cuban-like revolution, even now, uh, some 60 years after the original, 50 years after the original Cuban revolution. Um, uh, over half of the people throughout the region uh, say that democracy in their country is not working very well. And roughly 70% of the populations throughout Latin America, and with variation from country to country, indicate that um, they have no faith in either political parties or parliament or the judiciary. And all of this now complicated, as we know, by current social conditions, uh, including drug trafficking, and an almost uncontrollable rise in, uh, in violence, uh, in criminal violence, and particularly homicides. Uh, I'm so old that I went to Honduras, for example, the first time in um, 1963, and found there a country that uh, almost conforms to your stereotype of a sleepy banana republic, a peasantry that hadn't been mobilized, a political system dominated by elite families, almost no middle class, um, and now, and no violence either, incidentally, a very peaceful sort of sleepy little country um, back in the 1960s. And now you may be interested in knowing that Honduras leads the world uh, in homicides per capita. It's become the most violent country in the world. More violent than Uganda or Cambodia or others that you might think of that have dominated headlines 
um, in recent uh, years or decades. There is uh, a long-standing cycle of instability, of poverty, of social inequality, of corruption, of dysfunctional governments, um, which have uh, continued even on into this newer area, era of uh, democratization. So the first theme to think about is that democracy isn't working very well in the region. It's not delivering social and economic programs. Uh, its populations, the Latin American populations, are dissatisfied with the very institutions, political parties, parliaments, et cetera, the court system, that we think of and associate with democratic rule. So that's the first theme that I want to talk about, is incomplete democratization. And with that, weak states, often unstable states, that are unable to deliver real social and economic programs, housing and health care, um, poverty alleviation and so forth, to their own citizens, and therefore make Latin America look to me much more unstable than just this simple statistic of 19 out of the 20 countries are democratic would lead one to believe. Um, a second threat or current within the region is what we'll call transnational security challenges. Uh, here what we're dealing with is a certain fragmentation of control um, uh, or of the ability of governments to affect uh, the level of violence in their own countries. These are fueled by illegal drugs and weapons, the weapons, many of which come from the United States, uh, illegal money laundering, uh, illegal intellectual property uh, theft, um, uh, this in turn has opened the door to even greater uh, violence uh, within the region. You may be interested in knowing that Latin America and the Caribbean now rank as the world's most violent regions with an average homicide rate of about 28 murders per 100,000 uh, population. Africa, by contrast, which we think of as the most undeveloped, uh, underdeveloped area of the world, by contrast has only eight murders uh, one quarter that of Latin America per 100,000 uh, population, and South Asia, which means India, Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, uh, only four murders uh, per 100,000. Uh, the Pan American Health Organization considers anything above 10 murders per 100,000 to be an epidemic uh, in their definition uh, of the term. Um, I've just come back, as Christine indicated, from El Salvador, where I, where I spent some time uh, earlier in my career in the 1960s, before uh, El Salvador exploded in revolution and civil war, and then during that period extensively in the 1980s when El Salvador was going through civil war, I was very much involved as a policymaker in those, in those events. And um, I've gone back uh, many times since then, and just most recently, and I'm just astounded by the level of violence uh, in El Salvador and now spreading throughout the Central American region. Many of us who were active during those earlier days think that, or thought that, you know, in the early 1990s, uh, that we had solved, or at least resolved, uh, to a certain degree, to the extent that any of these problems are really resolvable, some of Central America's conflicts. Uh, the Sandinistas were no longer in power in Nicaragua. Uh, the guerrillas in El Salvador were suing for peace and becoming a political party as distinct from a guerrilla uh, organization. Uh, it looked uh, 20 years ago that a number of Central America's problems uh, had been resolved, and therefore to go back now and discover uh, the sheer amount of violence and criminal activity and gang activity about which we read in this country uh, becoming as extensive as it has. I mean, every, every day that I was in El Salvador, you would wake up 
to uh, a list of murders uh, in the newspaper of the most violent uh, sort, gruesome sort, of the sort that you're, I mean, we've all seen some of this in, in terms of Mexico. Uh, we're probably not getting the coverage of Central American violence that we ought to get. People's heads cut off, decapitated, uh, dis disfigured, uh, people burned alive in their automobiles. Uh, what was striking when I was there was several cases, I don't want to go down this tangent too far, but several cases, just to make this a little more alive, in which uh, uh, remittances, you know, the money that Salvadorans earn in this country and then send back to relatives back in their home countries was the trigger for the violence. In other words, well-meaning uncles and aunts and godfathers and godmothers who came to this country during the, during the El Salvador troubles of the 1980s and have done fairly well in this country and are now sending money back to their nephews and nieces uh, back in the old country and maybe sending uh, Nike tennis shoes as well. Uh, in El Salvador, just like in downtown Washington, D.C., people are murdered by 12-year-olds or 11-year-olds for a pair of sneakers or a t-shirt or a leather jacket or over a girl if you're 12 years old. I mean, the level of violence uh, to me was just out, uh, astounding. I had never, I've, and El Salvador has a long history of violence. I was telling Christine some of the stories from my early adventures there uh, way back in the 1960s, and it really looks like not very much has changed. It is democratic on the surface, but below the surface, it is a very violent and violence-prone uh, society. Uh, so it's really scary, and I think a lot of these threats now, uh, which we've all read about in the newspapers, have become cross-border threats. They're transnational threats. They've spilled across the borders so that the gangs in El Salvador now have branches in Atlanta or Washington, D.C., or Houston, or Dallas, or San Diego, or Los Angeles. Uh, for example, or maybe the gangs are centered in Los Angeles and the branches are back in El Salvador, which can be the case uh, as well. But in any case, this kind of violence has become transnational. It's cross-border violence. It's no longer limited to little El Salvador itself. The third factor that I want to talk about is that the security environment today um, is built upon ineffective cooperation among the Latin American countries. Um, that was always the case, I think. That is, the Latin American countries tend to look toward Europe, or they tend to look toward the United States, or now increasingly toward Asia, but very seldom toward each other in terms of cooperation or knowledge about neighboring countries. Uh, where's my friend from Argentina? Is she here? There she is. Yay. Um, you know, the Argentines actually, other than disliking them, really don't know very much about Brazil. And the Brazilians, rather than, uh, other than hating the Argentines, uh, whom they think of as snooty and racist, to be honest, which is not a very pleasant way to think about your neighbors, um, don't know much about Argentina. They've never been there. They never travel there. If they do tourism, they go to Orlando, not to Buenos Aires. Uh, and the same thing in Uruguay. You know, if you live in Montevideo, you could easily go across the estuary of the Rio de la Plata to Buenos Aires, but Uruguayans don't go to Argentina on vacation. Uh, they go to the Caribbean or also to Orlando, uh, where they've bought orange groves. And so that, what else would you buy in uh, Orlando? Um, if you're a rich uh, Uruguayan or, or, uh, or Brazilian at this stage. In any case, there's little knowledge among the countries uh, of the region of each other, and there's little cooperation between them. Uh, we know there's something called the Organization of American States, but it's not really much of an organization. It's a kind of dumping ground for over-the-hill cabinet ministers who want to spend a couple years in Washington um, which is a lovely place to be, especially if there's trouble back in your own, back in your own country that you need to escape from uh, for a period of time. 
Uh, I don't want to overgeneralize because countries like Chile, for example, uh, follow some very, very uh, sophisticated foreign policy initiatives. I was just in Chile this summer uh, after an absence of quite a few years, and I was really struck by how Chile has diversified its foreign relations and its foreign policy. I mean, we, we're probably prisoners in our thinking about Chile uh, in thinking about the Allende years back in the 1970s and then Pinochet, uh, who may or may not have been a creature of American uh, intelligence uh, services. But in fact, Chile has changed enormously in the last 30 years, diversified its economic relations. With modern jet travel, the Chileans are now as apt to take their vacations in New Zealand or Australia or the Philippines or Japan. The Chileans think of themselves as a Pacific power not one dependent on the United States anymore. Uh, their marketing is very sophisticated. The Chileans understand international markets uh, very well, and they have diversified their exports to Asia uh, and away from the United States. Uh, Chile is following a much more independent foreign policy, which is the case for most of the South American countries, uh, incidentally, but not so much cooperating with each other. So when we focus on the problems in uh, Latin America, what we often ignore is the fact that the countries of the region do not themselves cooperate very much in helping us in this regard or even helping each other. They tend to be rivals. They tend to compete for the same kind of markets. They're all trying to diversify away from dependence on the United States toward a broader range of uh, international partners. Uh, the fourth aspect that I want to focus on in terms of the, of the changing security environment is in Latin America an, an emerging independence from Washington. Uh, when I started going to Latin America in the 1960s, uh, Latin America was heavily dependent on the United States. And if you were a diplomat during that period, if you were a foreign service officer or an AID official, the American Agency for International Development, uh, it would often be the case that you would write the speeches for the president of the country, for example. Or you would be assigned a certain, pardon me, a certain cabinet minister, and you'd be responsible for that cabinet uh, level positions and policies. In other words, the American presence in Latin America was so large and so overwhelming that essentially we were not just dominating but running on an everyday basis uh, the local governments and local policy making in the area. There's a famous uh, article in Foreign Policy magazine by the American ambassador in Brazil in the 1960s um, in which he discovered that there were over 4,000 persons working in the American embassy in Brazil. And he questioned what could possibly be those 4,000 people be doing. Uh, it's unmanageable when it gets to be, the, uh, you should know incidentally that there are 17,000 now in Iraq. So as we wind down the military presence in Iraq, we have accelerated the civilian presence and how you run, any ex-ambassadors here, how do you run an embassy when you have, <laughs> how do you run an embassy, Mr. President, when you have 17,000 people, that's like, you know, trying to run the Defense Department with 3 million people. How do you run an embassy when you have 17,000 employees, many of whom are doing things that you don't even know about and have no way of discovering and probably report directly back to their, to their, to their agencies in Washington rather than through the ambassador's office, uh, which they're supposed to do. Uh, what, we're, what we're looking at uh, in Latin America is a greatly reduced United States presence in the region. Uh, our embassies are smaller. Since the end of the Cold War, we're not paying as much attention. We're preoccupied, as we know from everyday headlines, with our domestic politics and uh, economic difficulties. What we don't know so well is that while we are now preoccupied with our domestic 
uh, policy, the Latin Americans are going in their own direction and device, diversifying their relations, not only with other Latin American countries, but also with Europe, and especially now because, you know, as the old bank robber said, that's where the money is when asked why he robs banks. Uh, uh, the money is in Asia, we all understand that, including the Latin Americans, and therefore their relations are increasingly with China and India and Indonesia and the Philippines and Japan and the two Koreas and so forth, and not necessarily with the United States. It's really a very different international environment uh, in Latin America in which our ability to control or to manipulate or to manage uh, the Latin American countries is no longer there in the same kind of way that it was during the Cold War era uh, after World War II. A fifth aspect of this, and I need to hurry along here, uh, is the lack of attention by the United States to the region. Now, I attribute this to two factors. One is that uh, we are preoccupied with our own domestic uh, situation. If you, look at the, if you look at the public opinion surveys, they're very consistent, whether you look at the Pew. Uh, you have to be very careful, all of you know, I think, uh, with the use of polls uh, and public opinion surveys. But there's a couple of them, the Council on Foreign Relations and the Pew uh, centers that are, that are actually quite reliable and are good you know, in terms of asking non-biased questions that are not leading questions and so on. And what those polls are, are showing us that is that overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, Americans are preoccupied with jobs. It's jobs, jobs, jobs. It's the economy. It's not foreign policy. We are preoccupied with our domestic, uh, social, and economic uh, situation, and while that is going on, we have been largely ignoring foreign policy in certain parts of the world, with the, with the exception of the cases that we already know about, and that is Iran and Iraq and Afghanistan, and maybe now uh, Libya or Syria uh, or Yemen a little bit, uh, or Somalia, uh, where we are, maybe I should add Uganda uh, at this stage. Uh, uh, and that means uh, that while we are paying attention to our domestic politics, and understandably since 9-11 have been preoccupied with uh, certain Middle Eastern countries, uh, we're not really aware of what has gone on uh, within the Latin American region and the tremendous push on the part of the Latin Americans to move away from dependence on the United States and diversify their relations throughout the world and particularly establish their own relationships with the Asian countries instead of just relying on the United States, whom they now view as totally unreliable. That is, we just have not delivered uh, over the last 20 or 30 years or so. Uh, and it's much more advantageous from their point of view to diversify toward the Asian direction or even the European direction, and away from this overwhelming dominance, which was characteristic for so long during the Cold War, uh, of, uh, of, of subservience to the United States. The other thing that I'm worried in terms of our own uh, situation is uh, what we talked about a little bit with the smaller group earlier over T, which is the increased militarization of American foreign policy. Uh, over the last, uh, what shall we say, 30 or 40 years, the numbers are really quite out, uh, uh, astounding. The, the Defense Department budget is now over $700 billion per year. I actually work for the Defense Department, so, uh, you know, you should, <laughs> um, you, should, you should think of my criticism of my own institution as something that maybe you can rely on since my own job depends on telling the truth. Uh, in this regard. But you all know that the Defense Department budget is over $700 billion and has been growing rapidly and has uh, about tripled in size since the attacks of uh, September 11, 2001. The State Department budget, on the other hand, has been stagnant uh, over this period of time. So we were telling some of the students in the earlier session 
that if you're thinking of careers or jobs in foreign policy, you ought to think about those agencies whose budgets are increasing. And that means the Defense Department and the CIA and the Defense Department, the Defense Intelligence Agency and the National Security Agency, um, uh, the various branches of military intelligence and so forth, all of whom are looking for recruits, but not necessarily the State Department. And the facts of the, uh, of the matter are, uh, sad though it is, that the Defense Department can simply mobilize more resources and more personnel and more expertise, including my own and that of my colleagues, um, and more lawyers and more political connections and more constituencies domestically in this country. That's why we have military bases in virtually every congressional district uh, in the country, because that's where jobs are and you can mobilize those voters at election time. So nobody cuts the Defense Department budget, whereas the, De the State Department budget has regularly been cut. The State Department, unhappily, has no constituency in this country. Uh, nobody cares, to be perfectly honest, if the State Department's budget gets stripped to the bone, while lots of people care if the Defense Department budget. Um, I have been, and I'm sure the Ambassador has been, in circumstances in which uh, Defense Department personnel just, and, and money, and connections, and lawyers, and uh, to say nothing of military equipment, just overwhelm the State Department's uh, ability to mobilize uh, resources. Uh, the Defense Department has so many analysts down at the, at the country desk officer level and can mobilize so much expertise and so much equipment and so much funding that they just overwhelm uh, whatever the poor State Department or other agencies may be trying to do uh, in this regard. And I think we've all seen that to a certain extent in Iraq or Afghanistan, where particularly now, as the military component of those conflicts has begun to wind down, um, and the State Department presumably is to fill some of these vacuums, the State Department is not equipped to do so. Doesn't have the personnel, doesn't have the funding, doesn't have the guns to protect its people when they're sent out into the countryside. Uh, and more and more, what we have observed over the last 20 years is that the Defense Department is just overwhelmingly taking over what used to be thought of as civilian responsibilities, which in the past would have been handled by state or AID or other civilian agencies uh, who need to supplement, obviously, the military component of our policy. Now, let me talk about, uh, for a little bit, reframing and rethinking uh, security policy. How long should I go? Okay. Uh, if we think back about, about uh, U.S. policy in Latin America, to return to, to that theme. Now, uh, let me try to, let me try to, to set forth how, how historically we have thought about Latin America. Um, we almost need that map that we talked about a little bit earlier, but unlike uh, some, of the, some of the American public, uh, the surveys are showing us that roughly 30% of the public, incidentally, don't know which side of the country the Atlantic or Pacific Oceans are on. But I will trust that in this room, uh, and here at Washington College, we do know those things. So historically, if you think strategically, you almost, uh, for those of you who are interested in strategic policy, you almost ought to, ought to not read Che Guevara on, on, on US policy. You ought to go back and read uh, Alfred Thayer Mahan, who really was the architect of uh, American strategic policy uh, roughly 110, 120 years ago. And here's what Mahan had to say. On the East Coast, he said, we're protected by three or 4,000 miles of ocean. And this is, of course, before the onset of intercontinental ballistic missiles, right? But historically, at least, up until the last 30, 40 years or so in the Soviet threat, we had three or 4,000 miles of ocean on the, on the Atlantic side, on the East side, and therefore no real threat from that direction. And on the, on the West Coast, 
Up until Pearl Harbor, uh, we had uh, seven or 8,000 miles of ocean. And therefore, we were protected on that side. Didn't have to worry about that. To the north, uh, we have a fellow English-speaking country, except for Quebec, of course. And we all know, and incidentally, the surveys uh, support that, that English-speaking countries are more trustworthy than any of the other kind. Uh, but to our south, we have a number of small, weak, unstable, undeveloped, poor countries. And in Mahan's analysis, even very perceptive of him, even 120 years ago, he worried that the only strategic threat to the United States would come from the south. Not because any of the countries there are sufficiently strong, including Mexico, to really challenge us in a classic military sense, but only because their very weakness and instability invited hostile foreign powers, by which in the time he was writing, he had in mind the German communities that existed in Mexico or Cuba or Colombia or Panama right, who would take advantage of the very instability in these small, weak, underdeveloped countries about which we're talking to establish beachheads there uh, or to send terrorists into the United States or maybe serve as a fifth column to undermine United States policy uh, within the region. So that's the classic uh, American way of thinking about uh, Latin America uh, for probably 175 years until the Cuban Revolution changed all of this, when we began to recognize that the threat may come from internal revolution in Latin America, and not so much from foreign powers, be it Germany or Great Britain or France in the 19th century, or the Soviet Union uh, in the post-World War II period. Uh, and therefore, what we could afford to do in Latin America is treat these countries with a certain indifference because they were small and weak. We would use what the Pentagon calls an economy of force. Isn't that an interesting term, an economy of force? That is, uh, we recognize that the main threat would come from maybe a Germany or a Soviet Union where you would want to have a lot of force. But in Latin America, we could use an economy, a small amount of force, because that's all we needed to control small, weak, underdeveloped countries. And now what's happening is the Department of Defense and the Pentagon has discovered that that doesn't work anymore, uh, that these are very dynamic and change-oriented countries, that what happens in Latin America uh, inevitably has an impact on the United States, often through immigration. Not through military threat, but through immigration. Um, and the problems that uh, come out of that have to do with our domestic issues about schools and welfare, uh, and whether undocumented immigrants can get uh, in-state tuition uh, in the United States. And oh, not by accident, also, are they carriers of disease, uh, for example. Um, so health issues, housing issues, educational issues, social issues are all being compounded by uh, uncontrolled and maybe uncontrollable uh, immigration uh, at this stage. Uh, we're in a situation now of global comp competition for trade and influence the Latin Americans are booming ahead in this regard, and that means particularly the bigger countries of South America, Chile, Peru, Brazil, uh, even Argentina are booming ahead uh, economically, independently of the United States, and also their foreign policies are becoming much more independent uh, of the United States. Um, we have new threats to our security triggered by uh, terrorism, let's say, which are very different from the old Cold War threats and our worries about uh, communist or maybe earlier on German or other uh, infiltration into the Americas. 
the issue is, are we able to adapt our strategic thinking uh, in the light of these new conditions in Latin America, of a more independent Latin America, a Latin America going its own way and establishing relations and um, trade patterns with, with other parts of the world besides the United States? Are we so preoccupied with our domestic politics at this stage, which seems to be the case and probably is unresolvable given, as we already know, that we're, we're deep into the 2012 election campaign already. So you should not expect anything to be said sensibly out of Washington any time for the next uh, 14 months or so. Um, uh, you should not believe anything that you hear from either political party. Um, uh, The question then becomes, are we able to adapt? Can we make the constructive steps, uh, which will be difficult during our own financial difficulties, um, and which are slowing economic growth and thus making it harder to carry out a sensible foreign policy? Can we, think of, can we begin to think of Latin America as not just little uh, banana republics, Again, a stereotype from the past, which is still very much with us, but what we are required to do is think of them as equal partners at this stage. Uh, I would be prepared to argue that Mexico at this moment is the most important country in the world from the United States foreign policy point of view. Not that Mexico represents a threat directly. Mexico is not a military power, doesn't have nuclear weapons, can't threaten us but through the impact that Mexico can have on the United States internally. We are more dependent on Mexico than we are on virtually any other country in the world, including maybe even Saudi Arabia uh, at this stage, which has abundant uh, oil and natural gas supplies. How can we go about strengthening democratic institutions in Latin America, promoting prosperity, investing in people, and at the same time bolstering our own security situation if our own economy is in such deep trouble. Well, let me suggest a couple ways out of this, and then maybe we'll open it up to discussion and questions and even violent disagreements, if that's your, if that's your preference. I want to suggest maybe uh, three or four principles to to think about as we go into the discussion, period. One is, to use a, a political science term, we need to disaggregate Latin America. We can't think of Latin America any longer as simply a single region toward which we could have a single policy. Every country in the region is different. And, you may be surprised to hear, becoming increasingly more so, not less so. So a policy that tries to treat 20 countries, if we're talking about the Latin country, or 35 of them, if we're talking about the small states uh, of the Caribbean islands as well, policy has to distinguish between countries. We can't have any longer a single, quote, Latin America policy. There is no Latin America anymore in that kind of sense that we could throw all of the countries together and, and have a kind of cookie cutter one-size-fits-all uh, policy toward the region. So I want to suggest, for example, that we disaggregate, that we divide, that we think about these countries as individual countries, and in our strategic thinking, start to think about uh, Latin America into, in three uh, distinct geographic regions. Uh, the first is uh, Mexico. You may be interested in knowing, um, and it's not well known, incidentally, in this country, that Mexico, from the Defense Department's point of view, is no longer uh, thought of under uh, what's called uh, the rubric of SOUTHCOM, SOUTHCOM being the Southern Command, which is the military or Defense Department uh, structure of organization for the other Latin American countries. Mexico has been defined as under NORTHCOM, which is the United States and Canada, and now Mexico. Uh, which means that we're now thinking of Mexico as a North American country, 
not a Latin American country, and we're designing our strategic policies to think of Mexico as integrated into a North American region rather than uh, a part of Latin America. And you all know, I think, that, uh, that roughly 80% of Mexico's exports come to the United States and have integrated Mexico into American society. And not just exports, but also exports of drugs and people and tourists and investment and so on, which is why I emphasize this theme with regard to Mexico of uh, integration of Mexico into the North American uh, environment. Mexico is a special case, not least because we share a 2,000 mile border with Mexico, but because Mexico is really now integrated since NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Association, into the North American economies much more than it is integrated or connected into the rest of Latin America or even Central America. So that's one region that we need to think about. Mexico is a special case and a special country, and we had better start giving uh, special consideration uh, to Mexico uh, in this regard. The second region I'll call uh, the Caribbean Basin, meaning the islands of the Caribbean, including Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, the bigger islands, uh, as well as Central America, the Circum-Caribbean. That is not just the, the island nations, but the small, weak, uh, poor, violence-prone countries of Central America as well. Um, it's, it strikes me, after going back and forth there for some 50 years by this time, the first time I went, ever went to Central America, I hitchhiked uh, the length of the, of the isthmus all the way from Mexico City to uh, San Juan, Costa Rica. I would not advise you guys to do that in the present. Is that correct, Professor Wade? Right, <laughs> or either one of those. Uh, both of which I experienced, incidentally, along the, <laughs> along the way. Uh, but that's a whole other set of stories, which I'd better not tell. Uh, uh, when I first started going there, you know, these were poor, weak, underdeveloped countries. They're still poor, weak, underdeveloped countries. The level of violence is far higher now. Uh, from the point of view of United States strategic policy, we need to worry about Central America and the Caribbean a lot, not least because they are sending millions of persons into the United States, uh, but also their very weakness invites gangs uh, and criminal organizations and narco-trafficking, all of which is really astounding at this stage and completely out of control. Uh, we, we read a little bit in this country about Mexico as a possible failed state at some time in the future, like Somalia or maybe some others that you might think of. But the real possibilities for failed states, it seems to me, are likely to be Guatemala uh, or Nicaragua or Honduras or El Salvador, all of which are very precarious at this stage with weak governments, endless rounds of guns that are available, criminal gangs that are not just, you know, little 12-year-olds or teenagers anymore, but gangs which are really well armed and equipped and with international connections and millions and even billions of dollars in illegal money to, to spend on even more arms. And then the third area we need to think about are the South American countries, uh, none of which represent any kind of security threat to the United States, uh, either classically or by way of immigration, which is the case of Mexico and Central America, but which are all becoming much more independent of the United States. Brazil, as you know, is an emerging superpower. It's going to be like India or China in the 21st century, reinforced by the discovery of the world's largest oil and natural gas supplies in Brazil, which is going to make Brazil into a kind of tropical Saudi Arabia on the one hand, but also an industrialized country on the other with high tech and high industry and high agriculture and so I mean Brazil is going to be a power. And Argentina is not very far behind. 
and Venezuela and Colombia and Chile and Peru are all doing very well in diversifying their relations away from the United States. Uh, and we need to do a lot of fence mending in that part of the world because our relations with all of these regions, all of these countries in South America, uh, are, very, are very tense. Secondly, we need to reestablish a sense of a values-based security policy. We're not threatened by Soviet missiles anymore. Uh, we are threatened by, uh, by values, uh, values that are different from our own, that come from abroad, that represent often a lack of understanding of other people's cultures and societies on our part. Um, we need to recognize that peaceful and stable and prosperous countries, whether in South America or Central America and the Caribbean, foster conditions that help secure the well-being and the livelihood of democratic societies. And we need to encourage those things. We have been so preoccupied with the Middle East and with Islamic, uh, presumably, terrorism over the last uh, 10 years that we have completely forgotten our earlier commitment uh, to democratic uh, well-being, to social justice. Uh, we're just not paying any attention to the Latin American part of the world because Iraq and Afghanistan and Iran have just so overwhelmed our foreign policy thinking that we can barely think about other areas uh, of the world. The Obama administration is encountering uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean a new strategic environment. Uh, one in which uh, thinking about security will require some really innovative attention. I'm arguing here that a real sea change, S-E-A, a sea change, a monumental change is occurring in Latin America um, and in terms of Latin America's relations with the United States. Uh, the United States has disengaged from the area over the last 10 years as we've been, been preoccupied with the Middle East. And meanwhile, the Latin Americans themselves, thank you, are going their own way, independently of whatever the Americans are saying or doing. And to some extent, uh, that is to be encouraged. And to uh, another extent, uh, we need to worry about it because historic allies are being lost uh, along the way. Uh, meanwhile, the nations of Latin America are themselves coalescing in loose sub-regional groupings that are beginning to challenge United States dominance within the region. I think our uh, policy needs to be shaped by both long-standing and relatively recent uh, trends uh, within the region. Here we have a group of countries that are becoming increasingly democratic, uh, increasingly socially just, whose human rights situations are far better than they were 25 or 30 years ago, that if you look at a map, uh, constitute natural trading partners of the United States. We have things that they need, high tech and other kinds of things. They have things that we need, raw materials, uh, agricultural supplies, et cetera. Uh, there's a natural kind of relationship that could be developed between the United States and Latin America. Collaboration is not easy for a country like ourselves with a tradition of overwhelming power and one in which we tend to, be, uh, to look down and be condescending toward the nations of the region. But it seems to me that America's path to a partnership with Latin America necessitates reforming our own strategic thinking as well to take account of these new trends within the region, of which uh, most of us are not fully aware. Um, we tend to go, when we go at all, on student exchanges to Europe, mainly because that's where mother and father want us to go, and we assume that'll be safe uh, for Johnny or Mary. But I'd urge you to think about the Latin American part of the world as a student exchange as well. Go to the University of Buenos Aires, or the University of Sao Paulo, or the University of Campinas for a semester. You'd really learn a lot 
and you'd learn uh, not only a lot, but you'd learn a certain sense of empathy and of sympathy toward the aspirations of third world countries, um, including a more collaborative and a comprehensive diplomatic framework which would serve U.S. interests, not just in Latin America, but maybe even around the world. Well, let me stop there and see if there's some questions that some of you might want to raise. Christine, do you want to preside, or shall I just call on people? Either way. I'm an old... Oh, and then their teachers? After... No, no, but then, then other guests. Ah, okay. Thank you very much. My own sense is that the, the most uh, important factor is weak, weak states in Latin America that cannot deliver social and economic uh, goods and services to their own populations. And that applies to military regimes, it applies to civilian regimes. Uh, some of you may know, Christine certainly does, that uh, you know, in, in past years we would have heated arguments about Authoritarian, what, who delivers the most in terms of goods and services? Is it authoritarian regimes or is it democratic regimes? Uh, is it corporatist regimes or is it liberal regimes, of which there's been quite a number in, in Latin America? And what, what we've discovered over the years is that none of those regimes, be they military or civilian or left wing regimes or right wing regimes, are very good at delivering goods and services. Their reach uh, which I don't think is a social science term, but I'll use it anyway. Their reach is largely limited to the capital city. That's where the action is. That's where the police are. That's where the military is. That's where society is. That's where business is. That's where all the lawyers are. But if you're trying to initiate programs that have an effect out in the countryside as well, where the bulk of the population still lives, the government's reach is not sufficient to deliver goods and services. So I would say that's the key, that's the key issue. Although, you know, you, you may well have learned it from a different point of view in your classroom, and I would respect that as well. That is, governments are just ineffective, and they're weak, and institutions don't work very well, and civil society is not well organized. And you often have chaotic societies that just cannot be governed, whether they're on the left or on the right, uh, for example. Sir. What's the main reason uh, keeping us from having diplomatic relations with Cuba? That's an easy one. South Florida. Okay. It's a swing state, right? It's a swing state. The Cubans are about 4% of the population of Florida. But if the vote in a state like, for, like Florida, which it has been over the last several presidential elections, remember that's how George W. Bush won the presidency is uh, in Florida, uh, thanks to the Supreme Court at, at the last moment. If the, if the presidential vote in, in, in uh, Florida is 49 to 49, which it has been for the last several elections, Republicans and Democrats, then that 4% that is Cuban is really important. And we all know that the last several presidential elections, you know, there are very few swing states, right? It's Ohio and uh, maybe Michigan and Florida and uh, Pennsylvania, maybe, right? Those are the swing states that are deciding presidential elections. So if you are a presidential candidate, you cannot afford to lose Florida. Uh, I think behind your question is, is this one, because a lot of people, including myself, have, have thought that this is really a stupid policy for a long period of time, and that we need to get off the dime in this regard and actually do something to solve the problem rather than just letting this thing linger and fester now and forevermore. 
and I think my own reading uh, in terms of the domestic politics is the only way that, that this could be done is that it's done gradually. In other words, we would say to the Cubans, okay, we will relax some of the restrictions of the embargo, which we can do, but then we expect you guys to release some political prisoners or observe human rights better than you have in the past or hold elections maybe at the local level, even if you don't want to do it at the national level yet. In other words, there has to be a quid pro quo and the Cubans would have to answer. And I could tell you some funny stories because I was actually one time, I don't want to make this an ego trip, but I, I was asked one time earlier on, Christine may not even know that this, even though she knows a lot about my history and probably has read even more between the lines, that I was actually sent once by the US government to open up relations with Cuba. And uh, I met, I mean, what an experience this was. I met with the highest levels of the Cuban uh, Communist Party Executive Committee. And um, the issue at the time was whether, and you're old enough to remember this, uh, with all due respect, um, is that was, uh, you know, could we somehow get the Cubans out of Angola? where there were large number of Cuban troops and they were tipping the balance toward you know, the Marxist-Leninist government uh, in Angola and threatening to topple South Africa as well in that, in that period of time. So the deal was you know, the United States would relax the embargo a little bit if the Cubans agreed to get their troops out of Angola. I don't, I don't know how well it's known, but you know, at one point, Cuba, which is a tiny little nation of only how many million people, 11 million people or so, uh, had troops, military forces in 35 nations of the world. That's almost as many as the United States has troops in. Uh, so the Cubans really had an active, not just foreign policy, but military uh, policy. Um, and it all foundered on the basis of domestic politics. That is, uh, the candidates at the time didn't want to touch it because they thought that they would lose Florida in the process. So, you know, I had a wonderful time because I was wined and dined by the Cubans and, you know, how often do you get to meet with the executive committee of a communist party? Right? That doesn't happen very often in their life. So that was pretty exciting stuff uh, for a little kid like me at that, at that time. But it led nowhere. This was, this was what we call track two diplomacy, right? Because open diplomacy didn't work or it would become public knowledge and you'd lose Florida. So they tried to do through a private individual, me, uh, as the representative because I had no, I'm not a State Department guy, I'm not, I wasn't the Defense Department guy, I was just an individual think tanker at that time and I got sent by, by the U.S. government to Cuba to open up diplomatic relations and it failed just on the basis of the, of the upcoming election campaign. So that's the answer. It's all domestic politics. It has nothing to do with, with rationality. At the other end of this, incidentally, unless you're inclined to blame the United States for all of this, is that the Cubans, we have done this several times. In other words, we have, we have told the Cubans that we will relax certain aspects of the embargo. And you may have noticed, although he's done it quite quietly, that Obama has done the same thing. He's now allowing remittances to go back to Cuba and Cuban exiles in this country you can now travel with their suitcases full of money for their relatives back in Cuba if they, if they wish to do so much more freely than was the case in the past. But the Cubans haven't reciprocated. That's the problem. In other words, we're willing to relax the embargo at this stage, gradually, as I suggested, but the Cubans also have to respond. And if they're not willing to release uh, you know, this poor guy who was, who's been imprisoned recently or some of their own political, the American guy who's, who's been imprisoned recently or their own uh, human rights activists, for example, then the United States can't respond with the next step, which was what the presumption was. In other words, we'd do this, the Cubans would do that, then we'd ratchet it up by relaxing a little more of the embargo if the Cubans released more political prisoners uh, and observed human rights and so on. But the Cubans have never been able to respond, which would then enable us to ratchet up uh, our relaxation of the embargo. But it's all domestic politics. Uh, when the first edition, if I can tell you one more story, when the first edition of my foreign policy textbook came out, 
uh, it was 1987, and I argued in that textbook that American policy was, I'm trying to remember what the figure was, was 90% driven by domestic politics. And then when Bill Clinton was elected president, uh, and the second edition of the book came out, and we all know Bill Clinton, right? He was, he's a political animal to his very bone. Whatever else you think about Bill Clinton, he's a terrific politician, uh, and probably the smartest polit politician in the United States. When the second edition came out, I upped it to 95%. Uh, because under Mr. Clinton, you know, foreign policy was all domestic politics. It was all aimed at getting Bill reelected in 1996. And then, you know, now I've got, I, I'm into the third and fourth edition, and I'm already up to 95% in my estimate of how much of it. And I don't think I can go much higher than that, even though it's still all domestic politics, so including the Cuba policy. than that. You know, most of us are used to thinking, when we think about foreign policy, we think of the historic triumvirate, right? There's the State Department and the Defense Department and the CIA. Those are the three main actors historically in American foreign policy. But what's happened now is that as new issues have come up and become hot issues in foreign policy, like drugs, for example, drugs means that the, uh, the DEA, Drug en Enforcement Agency, now has an international arm in an agency that used to be purely a domestic affairs agency. Um, and money laundering is now a hot issue, right? Because we know the drugs and the narcos launder money through all kinds of channels. And uh, money laundering, since that's a law enforcement issue, brings the FBI into uh, foreign policy. Now, if you know something about the, the sociology of these agencies, you know that the FBI is made up almost entirely of lawyers, right? That's what they do. They're, they're meant to enforce the law. That's their mission. What do these lawyers know about foreign policy? Zilch. So we have a real problem on our hands in that in the last 20 years since the death of the Soviet Union, a whole new host of issues have come up. Drugs, money laundering, uh, et cetera, which have brought into the foreign policy family a whole host of agencies, like the Justice Department and the FBI, who are not equipped by training or the background of their own personnel to carry out foreign policy. So my guess is this was some dope, finally to get back to your point, some dopey guy in the bowels of the Justice Department who thought, wouldn't this be a wonderful idea? We'll ship all of these guns to Mexico without any strings attached. And then when they surface, we'll know who's committing the crimes, right? Because we'll arrest them. Uh, and of course, it didn't work. And if you had even one iota of knowledge about Mexico, you would know that the guns wouldn't just go there and be indifferent and, and used by hunters up in the mountains, like Vicente Fox, you know, to shoot coyotes or whatever Mr. Fox is doing in his retirement, that it would end up in the hands of the very guys you don't want to. So that's my guess as to what happened. And then uh, Eric Holder, uh, screwed up, basically, and may need to be uh, uh, retired or resigned forcefully, uh, since apparently he knew more than he let on and may have committed perjury before the Congress. So if he committed perjury, he's got to go, I think. 
uh, if he really didn't know, which no one believes in Washington, um, then he may last for a, a little period of time. But that's my guess, and I, I have to tell you it's informed not by any insider knowledge of that, of that particular issue, and it is so shrouded in secrecy and in court cases at this stage um, that the real procedures and what happened have not come out as yet. But if there's a trial, and if there's a perjury issue that comes up, you know, then we'll learn a lot more. But that may be six months or a year off. So you may just have to wait a little while. Ooh. How come I didn't get the Prince Theater? <laughs> Is there music that goes with this performance? My pleasure. Thank you.